Point number one, um, the resilience of the default culture of American instruction. If you've read any of the international uh, studies of student performance and teaching practice in the U.S., you see that there are certain robust patterns of instructional practice that are unique to the U.S., that are highly destructive to higher level student learning, and that are deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in the structure of the institutions and in people's beliefs about the nature of teaching. Just a couple examples. When you code uh, classroom practice for level of cognitive demand, that is, what are the nature of the questions, what are the tasks that students are being asked to do, do, teach, do students understand the tasks they're being asked to do, and if you did the task, what would you know how to do? You get a number in our networks that looks pretty much like what the data say in the aggregate about the U.S., which is 80% of the work is at the factual and procedural level, and students have no idea what it means. Not a clue. Not a clue. And the really depressing thing is they're not even procedurally fluent, right? We have kids who are in state-of-the-art literacy instruction now, cohorts of kids who've been through the entire elementary grades receiving very high-level literacy instruction, where the classroom culture is completely different from the default culture. We have longitudinal data that says that these kids cannot do things in the eighth grade that we knew they could do in the fifth grade. Right? That is, we have the student ID number, we have the task, we have the level of performance on the task. We follow the student to the eighth grade. The student can't do the work. That's called the subtractive value of schooling, right? Those institutions are sucking knowledge out of kids at a phenomenal rate, just literally by main force, just like a vacuum cleaner, just sucking it right out. So um, if, you, if you let up, any second, just, just for one moment in the grade structure, particularly in the middle grades, it's all out the window. It's like kids ne were never introduced to it. You have to reteach it all over again. This was pretty shocking. Point number two, if I were to show you the transcripts of descriptions of instructional practice in nominally high-performing schools and nominally low-performing schools, you would not know the difference. That is, the patterns of practice in nominally high-performing schools look pretty much like the patterns of practice in nominally low-performing schools, which suggests to the degree that anything different is happening in nominally high-performing schools, it's not a consequence of instruction, it's a consequence of social capital. Big surprise, right? Shocking, revealing. A middle grade's principal in a brand name Connecticut school district, close enough to New York to be a bedroom suburb, but shall go unnamed, asked teachers uh, in the seventh grade to take everything they asked a student to do over the course of a week and just put a copy of it in a Xerox box underneath their desk. Um, at the end of the week, she got all the teachers in the gymnasium, put out a big uh, continuous table, and just put Bloom's taxonomy on the table. Said, take the stuff out of the box, put it on the descriptor that most characterizes uh, what you think the task is about. Guess what? 80% of the work, 85% of the work was procedural and factual recall. So um, the way I say uh, the way I say this to my students in my instructional improvement class is, 
Um, you, you don't change a culture like this. This culture has been, has been defeating people who try to change it for decades. You don't change a culture like this. You replace it. Right? You take it out and you put something else in its place. And the way you do that in the initial stages is not pretty. It, it involves requiring people to do things that they think are impossible to do. That's not the end state. The end state is you build up the capacity and culture to the point where those people are the ones who are making the decisions about what the next level of work is. But if you ask people to do high-level work in classrooms in the current culture, they will do low-level work and call it high-level work. The predominant pattern of our observation is teachers teaching high-level content with low-level pedagogy.